The Hazara, the third largest ethnic group of Afghanistan, mainly Shia Muslims, speaking a Farsi dialect, yet with physical features similar to the Mongols and many Mongolian words in their language. Popular tradition holds that the Hazara are descendants of Mongol troops left behind by Chinggis Khan himself. But what truth is there to this? In this video, we will investigate this claim and provide a brief introduction to their history. This video would not have been possible without the generous and patient support of my Patreons. Further, I'd like to give thanks to everyone who assisted with research and helped provide materials for this project, including several people from the Hazara community. A particular thanks to my friend Matt Kapua, who spent considerable time researching this with me. Check out his band Wolfstar if you want some historically inspired heavy metal. Their next album is based on Tears' pre-Odinistic history. Let us begin with the standard narrative as to the origins of the Hazara. In popular rendition, after destroying Bamiyan in late 1221, Chinggis Khan left the garrison behind in the region. This garrison, left in the mountains of what is now central Afghanistan, developed their own unique identity, becoming the Hazara. Hazara in Farsi means 1000, and one of the Mongol army units was the Mingan, or 1000. Perfect! What's not to like? Well, the problem is that it's wrong. Chinggis Khan did destroy Bamiyan in 1221, but as we have covered previously, he did not linger. Bamiyan was a target en route to defeat the Khwarezmian prince Jalal al-Din Mingburnu. Jalal al-Din had just defeated a Mongolian force at Parvan, and in reaction Chinggis Khan brought the full might of his army against Jalal al-Din, lest he undo the last year of conquests. Chinggis Khan spent a large portion of 1222 in Afghanistan, sending forces to pursue Jalal al-Din in India, while he personally campaigned against local resistance. And it was somewhere in the western edge of the Hindu Kush, possibly in the modern Hazarajat, where he met the Taoist master Tiu Chuji. Certainly, there would have been Mongolian intermixing with the local population, but the medieval sources do not indicate he left a garrison behind. Khurazan, as the region was generally known, was left largely a ruinous buffer state when the Mongols began to withdraw at the end of 1222. Furthermore, Chinggis Khan did not appoint Mongols for garrison duty. This was a job for subject peoples, not Mongol horsemen. So where comes this notion that Chinggis Khan appointed the garrison that became the Hazara? It's rather simple. In the following centuries, emerging peoples and dynasties across Eurasia traced their lineage back to him, his sons, or his personal troops and commanders for legitimacy, Emir Temur among the most famous of these. It also stems from the common misconception that Chinggis Khan did all the conquering of the Mongol Empire, when it actually continued to expand for decades after his death. We can therefore point to likelier sources for the Mongol Hazara connection. Afghanistan and the Hazarajat was incorporated into the Mongol Empire in the 1230s and 40s by the generals Dair and Mungedu during Chormakun's march against Jalal al-Din. Under Chormakun, most of Iran and the Caucasus came under Mongol control. Unlike Chinggis Khan, who spent only months in the region, Dair and Mungedu spent several years subjugating eastern Iran, Afghanistan, and what is now modern Pakistan much more time for Mongolian genetics to enter the local population. Further connection comes after 1260. While I have not covered it on this channel, I have written on it in these videos with kings and generals. In the 1250s came the third great wave of Mongol troops into Iran, under Hulagu Khan, soon followed by the breakup of the Mongol Empire into four independent Khanites, Hulagu founding the Ilkhanite, Hulagu was quickly at war with his cousin to the north, Berka Khan of the Golden Horde. With the outbreak of war, the Juchid troops who had accompanied Hulagu on the campaign fled under their commander, Neguder, to Afghanistan. These troops, called Neguderis or Karaunas, became a third party in the region, acting as raiders independently attacking the Ilkhanate and India. In the 1290s, 
coming under the control of the Chagatai Khans. In the mid-14th century, some of their members ruled in the divided Chagatai Khanate and Delhi Sultanate. The Amir Kazagan was a Negudari, and Giyath al-Din Tughluq, founder of Delhi's Tughluq dynasty, may have been of Negudari extract. Negudari territory was still Eastern Khorasan, that is, Afghanistan, and I believe it is this extended Mongolian presence which provides the most likely origins for the Hazara. It's important to note that this was not a purely Mongolian extract, as mid-13th century Mongol armies were a mix of Mongols, various Turkic tribes and other ethnicities. And in the case of the Negudaris, they mixed with the local Farsi-speaking population. The 13th century was hardly the final movement of Turco-Mongolian peoples. Afghanistan and the surrounding regions were long incorporated into the Timurid Empire. Timur's fourth son, Shah Rukh, ruled from Herat until his death in 1447. So, rather than a specific garrison left behind by Chinggis Khan, we instead find the origins of the Hazara to be more likely waves of Turco-Mongolian troops over the 13th and 14th centuries, immigrating into the pastures in the mountains of the Hindu Kush to escape the summer heat, gradually mixing with the local Farsi-speaking Muslim populations and becoming what was later known as the Hazara. Lacking written histories, Hazara oral traditions, when they do discuss their origins, do often connect them to the Mongols. In one version, they were a rebellious people forcibly moved into the region by a frustrated Chinggis Khan. Our earliest definite mentions of a distinct Hazara people comes at the very start of the 16th century in the memoirs of Babur, the founder of the Mughal Empire. A descendant of both Tamer and Chinggis Khan, Babur was a prince from Fergana during the fragmentation of the Tamerid Empire in the late 15th century, forced south to Kabul by Muhammad Shaybani's Uzbeks. In his memoirs, the Babur Nama, he provides our first direct description of the Hazara in the mountains west of Kabul. In Babur's memoirs, the Hazar and Negadari often appear together, though he indicates a distinction both between them and from Mongols. The Hazara and Negadaris were rather warlike, controlling mountain passes and attacking travelers. Babur recounts an episode where a Hazara tribe had blocked a ford over a river, and Babur's men forced them from it. Then, attacking the Hazara camp and capturing hundreds of sheep and horses. At other times, they are mentioned refusing to provide tribute, while some join Babur's forces as mercenaries. The Hazara were thus a distinct entity by the early 1500s, described by Babur as semi-nomadic, speaking Moguli, and continuing to practice horse archery. The region remained under the Mughal Empire's influence for centuries, and the Hazara were an important local military element for them. Their contribution was important to Mughal victory over an Uzbek invasion in 1624. That the Hazara came from various mixes of Iranians, Turks, and Mongols explains why today the Hazara tribes are so diverse. Great variation in dress, custom, and even language exists over the breadth of the Hazara Jat. These differences can be seen even in tribal names. Some Hazara tribe names have obvious Mongolian origin. One of the larger tribes is called the Bashuri easily traceable to the Mongolian tribe of the same name, to which Jevnoyan belonged. A subtribe of the Bashuri is the Burjigui, which may perhaps come from Burjigun, the clan of Chinggis Khan himself. Some, like the Dai Chuban, can be traced to a person, in this case likely Choban, a powerful emir from the last years of the Ilkhanate, who gave his name to one of its successor states, the Chobanids and whose son, Hussein, is known to have been in the Hazarajat. Some are less obvious, such as the Zardalu, which comes from the Persian word for apricot. The Mongolian origin theory is by far the most popular, both in the West and among the Hazara. It is not the only one, however. There are a few who argue that a distinct grouping called Hazara have inhabited the region since the time of Alexander the Great. Actual evidence for this is lacking, and unsupported by medieval sources or by genetics. 
The Hazara show significant genetic distinction from Afghanistan's Pashtuns and Tajiks, and genetic studies indicate a relatively recent arrival to the region. Unsurprisingly, these studies show overlap with Northeast Asian populations, that is to say, Mongols. With this brief introduction to their origins, let us look to the Hazara themselves. The home of the Hazara is the Hazara Jat, the western edge of the Hindu Kush, specifically the Koi Baba. The precise borders of the Hazara Jat have shifted, but have stretched from the edges of Kabul towards Herat, the former capital of Shah Rukh bin Taimur. South it has reached towards Kandahar, and in the north the Balkh. These mountains are closely tied to Hazara identity providing not just home, resources, arable valleys and fresh lakes, but protection from outsiders. It is here that they live, mainly through agriculture, but with some semi-nomads. The five snouts of Mongol nomadism were still present among the Hazara. Sheep and goats, as with the Mongols, were the most common herds, with small camels, horses and oxen, though in much smaller numbers, especially since the end of the 19th century. The Hazara speak a dialect of Farsi, Hazaragi, with about 10% of their words originating in Mongol with notable Turkic influences. Politically, the Hazars have not based their leadership upon Chinggisid descent, unlike other peoples who emerged after the Mongol conquests like the Kazakhs or Uzbeks. The Hazara are also infamously politically disunited, most authors noting the historical tendency for the Hazara to fight amongst themselves as much as with outsiders. Until the end of the 19th century, the Hazara lived autonomously. The Begs, Mares, or Sultans of the Qaums, the political heads of Hazara society, with great social and economic power. Even today, marriage between Hazaras and non-Hazaras is rare, most marriages occurring within the same tol, and rarely between Sunni and Shia Hazaras, or even Sixer and Twelver Shias. Similar to the Mongols, on the husband's death, the wife would be married to his brother. And perhaps in further carryover, women generally had greater freedom, rights, and voices than those among the Pashtun. Speaking of the Pashtun, we now cover a more tragic period in Hazara history. Westerners, if they have heard of the Hazara, generally know them for two things. Mongolian origins and oppression by the Pashtuns, the largest ethnic groups of Afghanistan. Speakers of Pashtun, the Pashtun are nomadic Iranic tribes from the south and east of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Unlike the majority of Hazara, the Pashtun are Sunni Muslims. Precisely when the Hazara became Shia Muslims is debated. Musawi suggests a number may have converted to Shiism in the first place, with further conversion encouraged in the period of the Safavid Shah Abbas the Great. Mainly twelve are Shiites, other Shia sects are represented among the Hazara, as are some Sunnis. There was not excessive conflict between Pashtun and Hazars before the late 1800s, though it certainly occurred. More common Hazar foes were the Turkic Uzbeks in the north. While paying their taxes to the government in Kabul, the Hazars for most of the 19th century were left to govern themselves. This changed with the ascension of Abdur Rahman as Emir in Kabul in 1880. Uncompromising and ruthless, Abdur Rahman wanted to clamp down on independent tribes within Afghanistan, the Hazara in particular. Aside from their religious and physical distinction, they were among the largest ethnic groups in Afghanistan. United under one leader, they could potentially threaten Pashtun or even Sunni hegemony in the country. At the start of the 1890s, Abdur imposed government control over the Hazara Jat, but excessive taxes imprisonment of Hazara political and religious leaders, the cruelty of his local governors, and abuse of Hazara families led to large revolts in 1892 and 1893. These were serious events, inflicting heavy losses on government forces, threatening Kabul, and spreading across the whole of the Hazara Jats. But Abdur took advantage of disunity among the Hazara, and with greater resources and British military advisors, declared jihad and defeated both insurrections. Though the second uprising officially ended with negotiated settlements, Abdur immediately reneged on the terms. Hazara leaders were imprisoned and exiled, heavy taxes continued, thousands of Hazara men, women and children were sold into slavery, and many more forced from their lands. 
turning their valuable arable land into grazing for Pashtun nomads. Much of the Hazara Jat was lost in this way, and many Hazara fled Afghanistan altogether to Iran in what is now Pakistan. Mosavi suggests over half of the Hazara population was killed or displaced in this manner. I prefer not to talk about modern politics on this channel. There are many people far more knowledgeable on this than I you can find on YouTube. But we'll give a brief note on further events. The loss of so much of their lands, people, and existing local industry in the 1890s proved to be a significant blow the Hazara have struggled to recover from. Abdur Rahman's successors generally did not actively try to destroy the Hazara, though over the 20th century the Hazar Jat remained economically undeveloped, the government in Kabul ignoring the infrastructure needs of the Hazara. Like the rest of Afghanistan's population, they suffered in the turmoil following a series of coups and the Soviet invasion in the 1970s, even experiencing their own civil conflict in the 1980s. In the late 1990s, the Hazar were targeted in their thousands by the Taliban. Bamiyan, a centre of Hazar culture, once annihilated by Chinggis Khan, was once more a particular target. In addition to the terrible slaughter in the region, it was there that the huge standing Buddha statues, adopted into Hazara folklore, were destroyed in 2001. Built over 1500 years ago, Chinggis Khan himself likely looked upon them with a grudging respect. The Taliban also banned Hazara festivals like the Persian New Year, cultural acts, and greatly restricted the rights of Hazara women. The situation improved with the fall of the Taliban, and for the first time Hazara had a real role in Afghanistan's government, with Hazara top ministers and even vice presidents. The 21st century has brought greater access to education, political rights, and economic development for the Hazarajat, with their protection enshrined in the new constitution and renewed opportunities for Hazara women, though it should not be painted as a period of total prosperity. Every day societal and institutional persecution is ongoing. Decried for being Shia Muslims, their ethnic origins, physical appearance and economic status, the Hazara are subject to racism and difficulty accessing services in the still isolated Hazara Jat. Legislation like the Shia Personal Status Law have removed some of the rights minority Shia women were granted in Afghanistan's constitution. Kidnappings and disappearances on isolated roads, likely by the Taliban, are sadly common. And there are concerns as to what will happen with the total withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan. Attacks by Taliban and groups attached to ISIS on the Hazar have continued and even ramped up. The strength of Kabul's current government without US backing is uncertain, and in the face of renewed efforts by the Taliban, we may, unfortunately, see a resurgence in Taliban crimes against the Hazara and other minorities of Afghanistan. I hope you have found this introduction to the Hazara origins and history education. Further videos on the Mongol Empire, their descendants, ancestors and more aspects will come in future, so please subscribe for more. Thanks again to my friend Matt for his help on this video, and be sure to check out Wolfstar link in the description.